Good afternoon to you, Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com here. It's Friday, the 4th of August, 2023, and on today's update, all about that ace. No, it's not all about ace in terms of how we look at things, but today's update is all about the ace, the accumulated cyclone energy. I mention it often in my updates. You hear about it, read about it on seasonal forecasting uh, products that come out from Colorado State, for example, other agencies. They talk about the ACE score. Well, what's the big deal about it? What is it? Why, it's, why is it important? And then I'm going to show you some historical perspective of it. And then, probably going to blow your mind a little bit because I'm going to show you some of the biggest ACE producing seasons via sea surface temperature anomaly charts. You know, when we go back in time, we can say, okay, what year gave us a huge ACE score? How did things look exactly that year today? You'll see, you'll understand, and I think you're going to be like, wow. So let's start, shall we? We shall, over here at the Wikipedia page, all about ACE right here, cyclone energy, that's what it means, accumulated cyclone energy. It is a metric used by various agencies to express the energy, wind energy, released by a tropical cyclone during its lifetime. That's very, very important, during the whole lifetime. And uh, so, yeah, a short-lived, weak tropical storm gets a low ACE score, whereas a long-lived hurricane like Ivan in 2004, as an example, or Irma 2017, or even right now, Dora out in the eastern Pacific, it's racking up those ACE points. And the good thing is, if they can do that without bothering land, then it's all well and good. But when they do encounter land, these big ACE producers they typically pack quite a punch and there's some history in here and then here's the math calculation for you I'll put a link to all this for you on the description of today's video but I want to get to the meat and potatoes the core of the apple as they say of exactly why is ace a big deal it really helps because it tells us the quality of a season as a whole so you could have 18 name storms and a fairly low cumulative a score for that hurricane season and then you would deduce from that well we probably had several short-lived weak tropical systems maybe a weak hurricane something like that a category one nothing very intense at least nothing that lasted a long time conversely there's that word again you can have a season like 04 which gave us what 14 or 15 total name storms but the a score from 2004 was enormous. In fact, it makes the top 10 there. The ace count, all the hurricanes and all the storms of 04 gave us an ace of 226 points. You understand? And in case you were wondering, the biggest ace producing season was 1933, and that gave us an ace of 258. 05 is in there at 250. Then you have some years a long time ago probably had more activity than what we would, you know, than what's represented here because we didn't have satellites in 33, 1893, and 1926. We had boats and some airplane data. But in the modern era, even 1950 on, a little bit better reconnaissance and uh, weather radar at the shorelines anyway. And yeah, these are your big ace producing years. Not on the list there because it fell out of the top 10 is 2010 and the ace that year uh, I believe was about 165 or something like that just in case you were wondering and that's going to be relevant in just a minute but there's your top 10 list. What about individual storms in the Atlantic? Um, back in 1899 the winner is a category 4 hurricane that lasted 28 days not as a cat 4 but the whole life cycle was almost a month. 73.6 ACE units from that one system. Now, how many of you know what the single biggest ACE producer is of all time in any ocean of the world? It was this year, not too many months ago, I think we should have known 2023 was probably going to be special when Cyclone Freddy, yes, Cyclone Freddy, has an A score of 83 or something like that all by itself. I think it's on this Wikipedia page. It's dropped me out. I do believe it is in here somewhere. I know I saw it earlier. Um, yep, right there. The highest ACE calculated for a single cyclone on record. 87. I was off a little bit. 
But yeah, that was this year. Hard to believe, right? It seems so long ago. So let's go back to this, though. This is really important. Here's our box of top 10 Atlantic Hurricane seasons on record in terms of ace. We got 05 in there. Let's just look at the modern era. 04, uh, 95's in there. Okay. 17, 98's in there. Uh, again, 2020, busy, busy year. It didn't make the top 10 because, come on, you know, the A scores for each individual event were not very impressive. However, Laura made landfall and the ACE generating potential was skyrocketing. Then it ran out of time. It ran out of time because it hit Southwest Louisiana. So you get these big ACE producers coming ashore as they're starting to generate that accumulated cyclone energy. You got a big problem. Michael the same way in 2018. Category five, if it had been out over the open ocean for days and days and days like Irma in 17, then the A scores for each individual storm, Laura and Michael as examples, would be, have been higher. So ACE does not necessarily tell us about impact. However, usually your big ACE producing seasons give us a lot of impacts because you have more storms and hurricanes especially, and almost exclusively hurricanes, you have more of them generating these high A scores punching a bigger punch. Does that make sense? I think you're with me. So yes, your big hurricane seasons ace-wise can give you big impact years. You got that? Good, because I want to show you this. All right, 04 is on the list, and it had an ace of 226. This is what the sea surface temperature anomalies look like on this day back in 2004. You with me? You see where I'm going with this. What about 2005? Let's go back to the chart. It falls in at number two, ace of 250 in 2005. That is what the sea surface temperature anomaly distribution looked like on this date in 2005. We're not going to worry about the Pacific right now because we are literally in uncharted territory where we do have the El Nino, but we are going to focus only on the Atlantic right now. So this is what it looked like. That's what the map looked like this time, 2005, and we ended up with an ace of 250 that year. 2010 did not make the top 10. Isn't that amazing? Now, just referencing my phone and the old Wikipedia on here about the 2010 season, yes, 165 ace units that year, 19 named storms, but again, a lot of them short-lived, and not particularly strong. Yet, we still had Igor, pretty bad for Bermuda, and no hurricanes made landfall in the United States in 2010. I bet you some of you knew that, but if you didn't, now you do. So 2010 is on here because it was a big year, and it technically was a hyperactive year. Anything above about 160 is considered hyperactive, so that's why I put 2010 on here. So let's just look at it. That's the year that gave us 19 name storms and an ACE score of 165. That's what the sea surface temperature anomalies looked like in the Atlantic. And of course, we had a raging cold Pacific. Is that even a thing? Can it be raging cold? I guess it can. So there you go. Moving on into more modern times now, right? We're coming up on six years since this infamous season. And you bet 2017 made the list. And it gave us an ace of 224.88. And uh, this is 2017's anomalies. You know, impressive, but not like, wow, look at that. I mean, and we still got a top 10 ace year out of 2017. What about 2020? Again, 2020 did not make the top 10 list, but 2020 was a big ace producing year. I believe the ace in 2020 was 180, if memory serves. So again, 2020 was hyperactive, but a lot of storms we had 30 name storms, many of them short-lived, hurricanes only for a brief time, but we still had Laura, right, a very devastating hurricane. As an example, we also had Ada down in Central America and other events that we could single out. But 30 name storms, and yet 2020 didn't make the top 10 ace-wise, but it was still a hyperactive year, and this is the sea surface temperature profile on this date in 2020, 
that gave us a ace of 180. So let's drop me out. You remember all this? 04, 05, 2010, 17, 2020, all hyperactive years, and this is what it looks like this year. It's not even close. And I know I did something similar to this several weeks ago, but really relating it to the ace over here, if all of what I just showed you, and we don't have stuff going back to the 30s and so forth, the 50s, nothing reliable, but in the modern era, all these seasons were hyperactive with those sea surface temperature profiles, what in the world is this going to do? And it's really important because we have to start thinking getting ready if we haven't already. I'm just reinforcing that. So instead of like, oh, it's all going to come and get us. I mean, the evidence right there says, ha, look, we can see the past and it can help us for the future. If this doesn't scream that and help to motivate you, I don't know what else I can do. Now, we don't know the future. Maybe nothing happens at all. But I am preparing as a business, because I do track this stuff, I get all my equipment that we put out there. My colleagues and I have been really talking about this, that we got to take it probably a little extra seriously this year. And on a personal level, because I live you know, next to the coast myself in Wilmington, North Carolina, and we have to be ready as a family. This is very serious, and this is why we have the forecasts that we do from Colorado State, from UK Met office from the ECMWF, which is basically just numbers. It's not necessarily a team putting stuff together. It's just raw output. Everything suggesting the University of Arizona back in June calling for a very active season. And this is why. Once more, you look at the past. These are your big seasons. I can't even imagine what this is going to give us. All right. So one more shot here to say, look, people, pay attention. This is real. It's happening. The next six to eight weeks could be extremely busy. We are about to find out. Right now, though, on the good news side of things, nothing. That's good. In the Eastern Pacific, and yeah, we've got a couple of areas here. There's Dora racking up some ace points out there at 120 miles per hour. And it's going to keep on going for several days, way on out, well to the southwest of Hawaii. But as it does so at these longitude areas, as it tracks on through days four and five, it should create some swell that will come up here to the south-facing beaches. So if you're going out to Hawaii and are hoping to do some surfing after about days six and seven in time, right after this goes by, it takes a couple of days, you could get some pretty good action out there in Hawaii for surfing. Now we got another area here that's looking like it's going to try to develop well off the coast of Mexico and you can see what it looks like there on the static satellite imagery from the Hurricane Center and there's the area of potential track. Now this might, might be able to get close enough to the Baja and vicinity if we can get some trough action up here just enough to pull some of that moisture into the southwest, maybe. I'll be watching that closely and there's the outside chance, you never know, that this could come up and try to cut into maybe near the Gulf of California. But let's go back to that anomaly map real quick. Currently, pretty warm right up in terms of anomalies until it would just about get there, you know, right off the coast of like San Diego or whatever. Uh, so some pretty warm water to work with. We'll watch and see. That could be pretty interesting there in the eastern Pacific. Here's what it all looks like on satellite animation for you. There's our next system in the East Pack. There's old door out there racking up those ace points. Remember, told you, it's all about that ace today. This, my friends, is a nice trough. This is your westerly wind. Even some smoke mixed in in there. Um, not very favorable right now over the western Atlantic. But that's right now. The conditions will change. And we're looking at a pattern that would get more favorable with some ridging up here over the northwest Atlantic in the coming days as we get towards mid to late August. And then any of these tropical waves coming across right now, huge question mark as to what they do when they get to the western part of the basin. Something to watch for the future. In fact, we can see that on the GFS today. There's a tropical wave there. There's another one there. There's our system in the eastern Pacific. Really, nothing to worry about in the Atlantic over the next week or so. We'll move this out into time. You don't see anything that jumps out at you. I certainly don't. And that gets us through August the 11th. 
still about 10 days away from the traditional flipping on of the switch, as they say. Yep, nothing really to worry about in the Atlantic anytime soon, so that's good. You can take all this that I've thrown at you, and you got time to do something about it. All right, time is on your side. There's Dora over on the left, then there's that other system on the right. GFS says, yeah, it gets close to Baja, then turns out as high pressure builds in over the southwestern and western U.S. to block it and uh, not let it come north. We'll see. Maybe the leftovers of it try to get in train towards the Baja after about a week's time. We'll see. You never know. Could bring some rainfall, added moisture to the monsoonal regime of the desert southwest. A couple of odds and ends here for you. I thought this was an interesting tweet. Um, the July Nino 3.4, it's a certain region of the Pacific that we watch. The anomaly came in right on at 1.0 Celsius. So it's a degree Celsius warmer than the 30-year average or whatever they're doing out. Yeah, 1991 through 2020, right in the heart of the INSO region, as we call it. That's about, this is important, huge importance here. This is about 0.3 to 0.4 Celsius behind what the seasonal models, the consensus, were indicating in late spring. Strong El Nino by summer, by late summer, was too aggressive. I'm going to highlight that for you right there. That's really, really important because every day and every week that we are not in a strong El Nino, it's only at 1.0 right now in the heart of the Enso area. Every day that goes by that it's not there is closer to letting the Atlantic just take over and dominate. Very, very important. All right. I do find the last little bit here, big picture remains unchanged, warming resumes soon. I don't see a lot of evidence of warming coming up. We'll see. I mean, there's pretty decent warmth at the subsurface here, but this is interesting as well. No, I showed this the other day. We don't have this over here to get shoved eastward. There's no strong westerly wind burst coming. So I don't necessarily think we're going to get this rapid warming. Maybe warming generally and gradually comes on. And by November, we're in a stronger El Nino. But I think time has run out for this to come along and save the day. And, you know, it is what it is. We've got to be ready. Use all this to our advantage. Hey, real quick, Patreon made a great move in allowing anyone, if I allow it, which we did, to sign up and at least become part of our Patreon community. And then you can pledge and sign up for a level, the paywall, I hate that word, but I mean, we have to fund what we do somehow, right? It's not free, uh, but yes, you can at least join for free and then join the particular level that makes most sense to you when the time comes. So go to patreon.com slash hurricane track, all one word, hurricane track, or just get the Patreon app. It is fantastic. We can upload video natively to Patreon. I can do posts there, and all of you can see it. Like, we could literally have thousands of people on Patreon, and then when we have an event and you want to jump over to the pay side, which, again, supports what we do, all the gas, the hotels, the equipment, the fees, my salary, i got to make a living somehow, and it's all from you guys. And Patreon, two thumbs up. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Just reminding you. Because it's there, and I hope you'll take advantage of it. All right? So I know I threw a lot at you today, and it's not necessarily positive news, but I want you to remember, use... That's one of my things beeping at me. It needs to shut up. Um, we need to use this to our advantage. The past can definitely help us get ready for the future. So look at that as a positive when this is all said and done. we got time. There's nothing coming now. And if you've been waiting... This is a good opportunity to stop waiting and do something. Whatever it is that fits your needs, do something. All right? All right, that is it for me for today and for the weekend. Nothing to really worry about over Saturday and Sunday, so I'm going to work on some other projects, and I'll be back on Monday. All right, so you guys have a great and safe weekend ahead. I'm Mark Sadath, Hurricane Track. I'll talk to you again Monday afternoon.